Tonight we're beginning a new series that most likely will last about seven weeks. It may go longer, but at least seven weeks. The title of the series is Essentials of Interpersonal Relationships. In Hebrew, I guess we can call it Yisodot ben Adam lechavero. I divided this uh, series into three parts. For those of you who've seen the flyer, the first part will cover the chemistry in men and women relationships, which is divided into three parts. One deals with soulmates, how to find ones. The other deals with spouses, the unique roles, which we're going to be speaking about tonight. And the third part, a very important part, is the bond, the actual marriage, preserving it, or as we call it in Hebrew, shlom bayit. The second part of the series is the dynamics of parenting, parents and children, the joys and sorrows, children and parents, an eternal bond. And the third part is building friendships, which consists of choosing a friend, a friend for life, and being a friend, which will deal with neighbors and partners. As you can see from the various parts of this series, the emphasis will be on different types of relationships. And what they all have in common is ben adam lechavero, it's between man and man. You have the relationship between husband and wife, or the man and the woman. You have between parents and their children, and vice versa, children and their parents. And you have the relationship of friends, partners, and neighbors. Let me give you a brief introduction. I've never given a lecture on this. Maybe I've spoken about soulmates, perhaps, but I have not expanded too much about husband and wife relationship, uh, marriage. And there are several reasons for that. Number one reason, I'm not an expert in the field. There are many people out there, many good rabbis, who have specialized in this area and may have excellent techniques and how to preserve the relationship, how to enhance it. So I, I'm not an expert. But I can definitely share the information and some of the techniques that are out there, techniques that have been handed down to us from our rabbis, from Hazal, whether it's in the Gemarot, in the Midrashim, in the Zohar, and from personal experience, Baruch Hashem, after almost 19 years of marriage, I learned something. And I'm still learning. <laughs> so I think about now, I'm ready to speak a little bit about this subject. So that's one of the reasons why I have hesitated from speaking about it in the past. Another reason is that I don't want to give you the impression that I am necessarily a good example, and I hope my wife is not listening. <laughs> and third of all, and that's I think perhaps the most important reason, there's a saying in Spanish, de dicho a hecho hay mucho trecho. From saying to doing, there's a long road. So we'll, we'll be talking about a lot of nice ideas, true ideas, whether we apply them or not, it's up to us. So we can talk all day long about it and how true it is, but it's a whole different story applying it. That's really the most difficult part. But hopefully, once we get into it, we will be inspired, including myself, and it helps to listen, it helps to review these ideas, to further remind us of our unique roles, the roles of men and women, how each one is special in, in their own way, and how they both have something to contribute to the marriage. So let's begin. In reality, there should be, and there should have always been, classes and lectures about this subject, about the subject of marriage. Just like we go and take courses in other areas of life. We want to learn how to be mechanics, we want to learn computers. Regardless of what it is we want to learn, if we want to learn something well, then we take courses, and there should have been, and there should be, courses and classes on marriage. And unfortunately, the lack of courses can be seen in perhaps uh, why some of the marriages don't succeed, not because any of the two spouses are no good, it's simply mehoser yed, as we say in Hebrew, because there's a lack of knowledge. There's a lack of understanding of what each one really is, what each one's role is supposed to be. It's not that any one of the two is necessarily bad. I mean, there are people who are no good, 
but the majority of marriages that don't succeed really has to do with the lack of information, basic information of, of what's required. And there should be courses. And I know that if I would have taken a course, an extensive and thorough course, before I got married, then I would be able to have avoided many mistakes, many misunderstandings. That over time, of course, we see. If we're willing to accept, of course, we're, we are able to see it for ourselves. But that's too bad. Had I known some of what I know now, things would have been a little bit different. But it's never too late. <laughs> you know, the earlier you were able to get this information, the better. The Torah is divided into two parts. If one learns the Torah and goes through the various mitzvot, the commandments that we have, one will see that there is two types of mitzvot. There are two parts of the Torah. There is a part that deals with mitzvot ben adam lechavero, the commandments between man and his friend. And there are mitzvot ben adam lamakom, between man and God. When the men put on tefillin every day, when we keep Shabbat, when we observe the holidays, these are commandments that are important between us and Hashem. He asks of us for whatever the reason is, and we comply, and we build a very special relationship with Hashem when we do so. But then there's the other part, the part that deals with mitzvot ben adam lechavero, how to successfully maintain or build relationships with other human beings, Jews and non-Jews. And that's a very important part. It's so important that the rabbis tell us whoever does not have a good understanding and a good relationship between man and, fr and his friend can never possibly attain a good relationship between himself and Hashem. As the rabbis tell us in their words, Misha chaser lo be'ahavat re'im, chaser lo be'ahavat Hashem. Whoever is lacking in having a good friendship towards another human being, at least one, whoever is lacking that one area of friendship cannot possibly attain true love for Hashem. Imagine, there are people who we see around us, it's possible for us to develop a good relationship, a good Kesha with them, and we do not do so. How could it be possible then for us to develop a relationship, a close relationship, which as the Torah asks of us, Hashem you should love Hashem if we don't even see Hashem. Here we see our friends, we see our spouse, we can relate to them, and we could have a good relationship. And here we have a relationship that is asked of us to have between us and Hashem. We, how could it be possible if we don't see Him? Is it possible? Is it Shayach? And of course, the answer is, of course it's possible, but we have to have the tools. And the way to acquire those tools is to first develop the relationship of ben adam lechavero. And the same is true with Ahavat Israel. The rabbis tell us whoever lacks a love, the love for another Jew cannot possibly have the love for Hashem. The two are interrelated. I think from all the relationships that I mentioned here in the list, friends, spouses, parents and children, I think the, the one that requires the most attention, and that's the one we're going to begin with, is the one dealing with spouses. I'm not minimizing the relationship between parents and children and friends, but the reason why I feel that spouses, husband and wife, men and women, uh, deserves to be number one on the list is for the following reasons. Number one, a husband and wife hopefully will be spending many, many, many years under the same roof. I think 75 years of marriage life is called a diamond, right? 25 is silver, 50 is gold, and 75 for those few lucky ones is a diamond wedding. Very few people uh, live that long together. But the fact is still the same. Unless husband shalom is a divorce, the husband and wife will be living together under the same roof for many, many years, Bezat Hashem. That means they're either stuck with each other or Bezat Hashem, God willing, they'll have a loving relationship for many years under the same roof. You know what it is to live, to live with the same person this, under the same roof for that many years, no matter how good you are, no matter how good the other one is, it's not easy. Or is it? Is it easy or is it not easy? It's not easy only because, as you will see later on, the two are very different. 
men and women are very, very different. Even if the two were to be the same, after a while you get tired. Right? So it's, it's not an easy undertaking. Just the fact of living together is not easy. Then multiply that by the factor that uh, the two are very different. It's not going to be automatically smooth. It's going to require some investment. And the other Shem, what kind of an investment we'll talk about uh, maybe next week, maybe in two weeks. What is exactly required? Today we want to try to identify what those differences are. So the number one reason of why this is an important topic is because the two with other Shem will be many years together and they better learn how to live together. Number two, why this is an important topic is because however one is with his wife, with his spouse, that will have an immediate effect on his relationship with his children because the children learn by observation how, their, how one's children will, will fare when they get married depends to a great deal on how one observed in his parents, did his parents have a good marriage or not? How did the husband relate to his wife? Will therefore have a tremendous impact on the other kind of relationship. The children to parents, parents to children, and children with their spouses. Therefore, it's important to begin with this relationship. Another important reason of why this is topic number one is because an individual can have two faces, one in the street amongst his friends, his peers, his co-workers, and one in his own home. Who is the, tr who is the true individual? The one how people see him outside or the one in his home? I think all of you will probably agree with me, right? But in one's home, one is really acting or being himself. The true individual is therefore not how one is seen outside, not how one relates to others so much, or how he, how he is, but how he is with his wife. And therefore there's no person in this world that knows one better than one's spouse. The woman hopefully knows her husband very well, and the man knows his wife hopefully very well. But when we say very well, we only mean it in certain ways. Hopefully, each one should know each other much more than just very well. It's not just superficially how one's habits are, how one's nature is. It's when, when I say knowing each other very well, I mean knowing the strengths and the weaknesses that each one has and how to deal with them. Because even if one of the two has certain weaknesses, well, guess what? The other one is out there to help, not to criticize. And as we will see later on, that is what you will put there to begin with. You will put there together. So the two of you can deal with whatever weaknesses are there. Nobody's perfect. I think everybody here wants to succeed in life. Everybody wants to succeed in whatever undertaking they take. Nobody wants to fail. And that includes marriage too. We all want to succeed. We, we don't go into this relationship to fail. And if that's the case, what is necessary is for, for us to know what are those tools in order to succeed. I will not give you all the tools now, but I will say one thing. It helps a great deal when the two of them know what their goal is. Why is a man and woman getting married to begin with? It's not just to have children even though that is a mitzvah, that is one of the commandments of Pru Urbu, that is part of the Takhlita Briya, the purpose of life, for a couple to procreate, for men and women to, to join forces, to build a home. But that's not the only part of their life. The goal is Le'ashli Mechan Tasheni, where one completes what the other one is lacking. Because as the Zohar says, each one without the other is really a half a neshama, a half a soul, or half a body. And an individual is losing a lot. He's not maximizing his full potential so long as he's single. And that's why the rabbis look down very much at somebody who procrastinates, who delays unnecessarily his marriage. For various reasons, not only because he's not having children, not only is he subjecting himself or exposing himself to sin as a result of him being single, 
but he's losing out. He's without beracha, without shalom, without a choma, without a wall, without protection, so long as he's not married. Therefore, the rabbis encourage one to get married the sooner the better. Because marriage, again, is not only for children, it is a holy union that serves many purposes. And one of the most important ones is Lashlim Mechat need to complete each other. And without that marriage, that would not be possible. So it's important, it's, it helps a great deal when the two people are dating. They should not understand this. What is the purpose of their marriage? Why are they getting into this? What do they want to achieve? Because even though they may have come from different backgrounds and spoken different languages and have different ideals, if they have the same goal, they want to both get to the same destination, it will be easier for them. They will be able to weather many challenges together because they're both headed in the same direction. They both recognize what their role is. They both want to get there safely. So hopefully, even if problems occur, they will work on them. So number one, the two of them need to know what is the goal, what is the goal of marriage. For those of you who have read Parshat Bereshit, you will see something interesting. Even though it's not spelled out word for word, but our tradition says that in the very beginning, man consisted of the two parts, Zachar and Nekeva, male and female. And then Hashem separated the woman from the man, from the rib, from the side. What's going on over here? Why did Hashem make them one to begin with and then separate the two? It would have been just better to either keep them all as one or have them separate from the very start, just like other animals. In the very beginning when Hashem created the world, you had males and you had females. You had animals at least of the two species, of the two kinds. No, the human being is different. The human being at first was created, Zaharu Nekeva Bera'am, as one unit. Then he separates them. But even though they're separated, what are they told? What's, what instruction are they given? That even though they're separate, their ultimate goal is, Ve'azav tavi v'timo v'davak bi'ishto. In the end, even though they're separate, the goal is for them to get back together because they belong together. In reality, they're one unit. And as the Zohar says, and I'll elaborate more next week about it, upstairs in the Olam Neshamot, where the souls are, it's all one Neshama. It always is one soul when it begins. And it splits into two. And usually the Zachar, the male, comes down first, and then the female follows. So each Zachar, each male, has another half. That is the soulmate, the Nekeva. And the goal is for them to get together and join forces. But why did Hashem create them physically at first as one? There's an important lesson over here. And the lesson is that in reality they are one. They are meant to be one, and that should always be their goal to be one. So Hashem made them one. They are one. They are the same. You are from the same source. You look at each other, you look different, but in reality you are the same. You, ha you, may be, you may be, if you are soulmates, you are sharing the same neshama. But Hashem separated the two to give us another lesson. Even though you are the same, you come from the same neshama, you're different. Each one of you has separate kohot. I endowed each one of you, male and female, with different qualities, different characteristics, different strengths. Because in the end, each one needs each other. You both need each other. You both can contribute to the marriage. What one has, the other one is lacking. Therefore, in a true soulmate relationship, one will complement the other. Because the two are the same in reality. But they're different physically and in the various strengths and char different characteristics that Hashem has endowed them. So Hashem separates the two, tells us 
each one has a different tafkid, a different role. You are unique, but the goal is still to work together, to come back together. And how do you do that? Through marriage. Not through living together, like many people are doing today. That's not the goal. The goal is to get back together in a holy union with, of course, the idea of having children and building, if one is Jewish, a Beit Neiman Israel. It was a home according to the standards of the Torah. That is the goal of a Jewish marriage. Combining the two forces of, of, of whom they really are one, from the same Neshama, and by combining the two forces, as the saying goes, two heads are better than one. The two are able to fulfill the mitzvot HaTorah, the commandments of Hashem. And they can do so working together, not working against each other. Hashem says, if you do so, then I will be a partner in this marriage. That is, that is why a man is called in Hebrew Adam, once he gets married, he's called an Ish. And a woman is a Isha. And the rabbis tell us that Hashem is the third partner. And that is the difference between the Ish and the Isha. There, was a she, there is a Yud in there. That's for Hashem. And there's a He in the, in the Isha. If the two work together and they do Hashem's will, then Hashem is present in their home. If not, what happens? Hashem removes the yud and the hay, and all that remains is ish, fire. What does that teach us? That to a great extent, the success of a marriage will therefore also depend on if one brings in the Shekhinah into the house. The Shekhinah is in the house, the Shekhinah will protect the home and will help the two overcome the challenges, the many challenges that can be in marriage. Chaz HaShem the Shekhinah is removed, then that, of course, leads to trouble. All right, now that we have a little bit of an understanding of how this all begins, that they were once one, and then they split into two, I'm always confronted with the question, well, wait a minute, Rabbi. Then why do the men every morning proudly say, Shalom Asani Isha? We make a blessing that we're thankful, we're grateful that Hashem did not make us a woman. I just spoke about them both being important, them both being this part of the same. Then what, is this try what are we trying to say, Shalom Asani Isha? People misunderstand that. One needs to look at all the blessings together to have a better idea of what the rabbis intended here. Is that the only one we say Shelo? That, that we're thankful that he didn't make us something? Now we also say Shelo Asani Goy. We also say Shelo Asani Evid. So it's not only the Isha. So, what, so there's something else going on here. We're not looking down at the women. We're not necessarily proud of being men. There's something else going on here. What do the three have in common? Well, actually, they don't really have everything in common because a goy is very different. But what does an Evid and a Isha have in common? A, a servant. That they do not have the responsibility of fulfilling the entire 613 commandments. Men have a tremendous responsibility. Women too. But the men's responsibility is greater. 613. Women don't have that many commandments. The rabbis wanted to impress upon the Jewish man when he wakes up in the morning. Be proud of who you are, of what your role is. You know, we all heard about problems of lack of self-esteem, right? People who are depressed, people who are at loss about the purpose of life. Early in the morning, we say, we're thankful, we're grateful that we, we have a new lease of life. We woke up this morning, right? We're thankful that we we're able to go to the restroom. Some people cannot do that. They're on dialysis. Kidney problems. 
The rabbis remind us when we wake up in the morning, there's something for you to be thankful about. And say it. Don't just think about it. You have to say it because you have to convince yourself. You have to get into the state of mind that you're happy to be alive. You're happy to be able to move, to get dressed by yourself without the need of others. And they remind the man, Shalom Asani Isha, be happy the way you were created because you have a tremendous responsibility. You can achieve a great deal. A lot depends on you. So it has nothing to do whatsoever with looking down on a woman. We're happy we're not women. <laughs> women are very special in their own right. But in order for the man to remind himself of what his job is, that is the way the rabbis communicated to him. You have a tremendous responsibility. Your role is to fulfill 613 commandments. Then why did they say it in the negative way? Shelo asani isha. You could have said shasani ish. Why did it say shelo asani go? You should have said shasani yehudi. Thankful to, to have been born a Jew. So the commentaries explain because the rabbis reached the conclusion in reality it would have been better off for man not to have been created. Once he's created, the chances of him being tempted and lured to commit a transgression are greater than him behaving himself. In other words, the chances are 51% that man will fail in his mission versus succeeding. Mission of being observant in every respect. Because there are just so many temptations out there. It's not easy. Unless one, of course, is attached to the Torah, Yom Balayla, day and night. He's around good friends and good teachers. Then, of course, his chances are better. But otherwise, life is tough. So the rabbis are telling us, don't take credit for being born a Jew. The test will be, after 75 years or so, on this world, if you've lived your life as a Jew, then you can take credit. So long as you have not, so long as you are a young man, how could you say Shasani Yehudi? Are you behaving like a Jew? Are you living like a Jew? If not, then why say Shasani Yehudi? What are you so happy about? So we say Shelo Asani Goy. We're thankful that we're not Goyim. At least we have an opportunity to be Jews. Shelo Asani Goy by the, by the virtue of the fact that we are circumcised. We're born to a Jewish mother. That makes us biologically Jewish. But whether one is really, really a Jew, that depends on his ma'asim and his deeds. And that will take him a lifetime to prove what he makes of himself. So the same is with Shiloh Asani Isha. We don't take credit for being men. Well, let's see if you, like we say in Hebrew, tiye gever. Let's see what you make of yourself. Be a man. Let's see if you behave like one. If you really accomplish what you're supposed to accomplish. So we don't take full credit for it. But we say Shiloh Asani Isha. At least we're thankful that Hashem has given us this job. A tremendous job with a lot of responsibilities and this is serious it's not something that we're proud of this is serious and this is to remind us when we wake up in the morning so we're not looking down what about the woman who says Shasani Kirtsono a woman also makes a blessing that God has made me according to his will she also takes pride in the fact that this, if this is Hashem's will, then it must be good. Hashem only did something which is good for me, not bad. There's nothing bad that comes down from above. Also, a reminder that a woman should not feel in any way less than a man. She's special in her own way, and this is the way Hashem wanted it. Then it must be good, it must be, it must be right. Many of you perhaps have, uh, have seen or have heard of women who nevertheless feel that they're second-class citizens. And this is seen in various segments of Jewry, that they start filling in the role of the men, becoming chazanim, reading the Torah, putting on talit and tzitzit and tefillin. What does this come from? From this psychological... Uh, problem, I, I guess that we can call, that they think or they feel that they're less and they have to prove themselves that they're just the same, they're equal. The, what's the problem here? The, the problem is that women misunderstand that the two of course are equal. 
men and women are equal. They're from the same neshama, but they're not identical. Remember this difference when you go home tonight. There's a difference between equality and being identical, being the same. Equality, yes. Identical, no. Are men and women identical? I hope not, unless you go to Melrose, maybe. You know, you, you might get confused, you know, some, you know. Yeah, but they're not supposed to be identical. I mean, but there are, you know, people that uh, are trying to change the roles and do all sorts of things. Men and women are physically different. They are built differently because they have different roles, different tafkidim. Nevertheless, they are equal. So when it comes to the mitzvot, a woman who feels that she has to prove herself, it shows that she has a lack of understanding that she is special and in her own way, and she's not any less equal than the man is. She doesn't need the mitzvot. The man is the one that needs mitzvot. Man was given mitzvot. He needs them to build himself. If the man were given necessarily need every single mitzvah, that's all. It has nothing to do with equality. They both are equal and just as important. So what I'm going to do right now in the next few minutes is just to give you a little bit of an understanding of what the differences between men and women are. There are quite a bit, but we're just going to cover a few just to impress upon you that each one in reality has a different purpose. And in the end, if they combine their, the, the two forces, they're able to achieve a great deal. And I have here a list of uh, what those differences are. Rabbis tell us that men and women are two completely different worlds. Women, da'atan kala. Da'atan kala means that their mind is light. Now don't misunderstand that. It does not mean that they're not as smart. There are some women who are much smarter than many men. What does it mean, da'atan kala, that their mind is light? It means two things. That they can easily be tempted and lured much more easily than a man. And it means that they don't always see with the same severity the consequence of their actions. As a result of that, they make certain mistakes. All right? That's the meaning of da'atan kala. So when you come across that in the book, if, you happen to be, if you're a woman you happen to be reading it, don't look at, oh, the rabbis made fun of women. Like some people in other segments of Jewry try to claim, look how the rabbis looked at women. It's not true. The rabbis were able to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of both men and women, both. We, the men also have their strengths and weaknesses. And they analyze it in order to explain to us better how to deal with that and why there are certain exemptions for women, for example, from certain mitzvot. So that's the one difference. Number two, there are several characteristics or qualities that are more developed in women than they are in men. Number one, the curiosity. Women are much more curious than men. They are more critical. And they're more talkative. Does this sound familiar to you, the men? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not making fun of anyone. <laughs> I'm just quoting here. But there's nothing to laugh about, because that's the nature, and you know what? If you think you're going to change it, forget about it. <laughs> That's the way it's there, and it's meant to be. And, and there's a reason for everything. Don't worry, I'm going to speak about the men soon too. What? What is that? Of course, there are men who are extremely curious and talkative too. Yeah, But we're talking about the majority here. For every rule, there's an exception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't need to get into more details, but I'm just giving you some examples, just to show you that there are quite a few differences. 
women have more difficult time with guests than men do. You know, if you ever invite someone and you don't tell your wife, you can, you know, get into trouble, you know, for surprising her. If you do ask her, she's also going to give you a hard time because they're not necessarily excited about it. But don't look at it as something bad. It's simply because they want to look good. They want to host good. They want to do a great job. And it requires a lot of them. It dem it's very demanding. Because of that, they'd rather not get involved. On the other hand, there are some good qualities that they have. They're much more rahmanyot. They're much more compassionate than the men are. That's not always good, but it's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very nice. They are more sensitive. Is that good or bad? It all depends. <laughs> Sensitivity can be good or bad. Well, because women are sensitive, the rabbis, are tell, us, the rabbis tell us, be very careful not to over-criticize her, not to yell too much, because dima'ata mitsuya, she easily cries. You might say, so, well, so what? Well, that's called onaati shto. That's called causing or inflicting pain on one's wife. You know, you can cause pain physically and you can cause pain with words. And words sometimes are more painful than physical pain, emotional pain. And since she cries easily, you may be transgressing this sin of inflicting pain much more quickly with your spouse than you would be with some other man. It takes very little to bring her to tears because she's sensitive. Women are also endowed with greater bina. Even though I said before, da'atan kala, the mind is light, they are endowed with much more bina. I think the best translation for bina is a better intuition. They're more intuitive. As an example, the rabbis tell us, even though they don't like the guests, they don't like to have them to begin with, once they're there, she will have, the woman will have a better intuition as, I don't like the guy. <laughs> There's something about him I don't like. And you know what? <laughs> she's right. There's something, if she says so, and she's objective, then there's something that she smells. That's called Binayetera. And the husband might say, what are you talking about? He's a nice guy. I go to golf. I go to lunch with him. Yeah, but <laughs> I, just, I just sense it. Rabbis tell us, you know what? If your wife is short and you're tall, bend down so you can seek her advice in certain areas of life. Because they have this binayatira, this intuition that if you used, if you heated, only in certain areas, not in all areas, because in other areas, uh, you know, one needs to be very careful in, in judging the situation according to the halakha and according to other requirements. And the woman may not be the the right person to consult with, depending on what, what area this is. But in certain areas, the rabbis tell us, if she's short, then lower yourself down. Lower yourself meaning two things. It means physically lower yourself down to, to speak to her, and lower yourself, lower your ego, and forget about that, and get her advice. And many men have made terrible mistakes because they didn't follow the advice of their, of their wives. But again, I repeat it, depending on the area, when it comes to having a uh, an, an understanding of human beings, they have a better intuition as to the qualities or the character, the true character of this man that you've invited or that you're seeking to be his partner. Something tells me, she says, I have this hunch or this gut feeling that this, is, this guy is no good. You better look into it ten times if she says that. Because she has been Yeah, there's... Uh, you don't need to, we, we don't need to learn that. We, we're told that that's a fact. You know. Obviously, Sarai Menu had this intuition, uh, plus observation that she observed Ishmael and Yitzchak. So it's a combination of factors that led her to tell Abraham, get rid of Ishmael. It wasn't just intuition. But Hashem said, you're right. Hashem did say to Abraham, listen to what Sarai has to say. She's right about this. What was she right about? The education of one's children. The women know a lot. They have this feeling, this intuition.
All right, let's talk a little bit about the men. Rabbis tell us a man is more easily appeased than a woman. If you wrong the woman, you're going to have a hard time getting her back. Having her forgive you, it's going to take a lot of work from you. You're going to have to buy her flowers. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to work very, very hard to appease her. A man is easier to appease. Anybody know why? The rabbis tell us that the woman was created from the rib, so she's tougher. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Not only is she tough, but she, oh, the sensitivity and the emotions are very strong. If she's hurt, she's hurt. Man uses the sechel much more than the regish. Right? The women are endowed with much more regish, with much more feeling. The men are endowed with a greater uh, degree of sechel, not in the sense of, 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 a, of more intelligence, but everything is seen with the mind versus the heart. Logic. Logic. Yes, thank you. Logical, rational thinking. And for this reason, the Torah says men are to be judges and witnesses, and not women. Because with testimony and with judging, you need logic, you need reason. We can't allow sensitivity, emotions, and compassion, and all these beautiful good things to interfere with clear judgment. It doesn't mean women cannot testify. There are certain situations where women are trusted, they are relied upon. But depending on the circumstances, it's not that they're any less, it's not that they're not intelligent, they're definitely fully capable of being good judges. Anybody know who is a good judge? A woman? Devorah, how could she be a judge? She's a woman. So first of all, she was a prophet, so that's an exception. So it's Minash from heaven. Number two, people went to her. They wanted to hear her. They wanted to, to, to listen to her advice. She was popular. She was smart. So, so if people, if men take it upon themselves willingly to go to a woman, then that's okay. And number three, it is, it is mentioned that her main job was to teach, not so much to judge. So she, even though she's called in, in some ways a judge, but she was really a teacher, a prophet and teacher. Anybody want to suggest any more differences? There are quite a few, but I'm just going to mention a couple more. Men don't have a need for jewelry. And women do. <laughs> And I just didn't make up a, you know, a difference over here. This is actually brought down in the Gemara. Shaisha or Hebet Women like jewelry. Because <laughs> diamonds are forever. <laughs> anyway, and same, same goes to dressing up and using perfumes. So if you ever wonder why your wife needs a pair of shoes for every dress in her closet, you know, when you only need three, and she needs 40, well, because it's important. It's important to her. That's the way she is. So you have to appreciate that, and it's not just something, it's nonsense, like some men would say. What's this all about? You just, you have to get another pair of shoes. You just bought one last week. Yeah, but that one is to match this dress, and this one is to match this dress. Who says it has to match? Don't you all know men that go with two different color socks? <laughs> they, they don't care. Right? Usually it's by, by accident, obviously. You didn't plan on wearing different colors, but we wouldn't mind so much. We wouldn't make a big deal. But for them, no. Everything has to be just right. That's the way it is. Anyway, so let me just... Uh, wrap it up. What is happening today, unfortunately, in the 2021st century, is we've noticed that many non-Jews especially, but even, though, even some Jews, have moved away from what has been our tradition, that each one has a, a, a special role, each one is unique in their own way, and today, people, especially in the non-Jewish world, have tried to take upon themselves women the role of the man by becoming firewomen, by going into the army, by doing what has always been traditionally a man's job. 
briefly, what is the explanation for this? Simply they have forgotten the unique role of the woman. What has always been the role of the woman? To be the mother of the children, to take care of the home, to take care of the husband too. Not to go to war. Women don't need to go to war. That's a man's job. It doesn't mean they're any less. They're special and they're unique in their own way. So it, there's nothing here to compete. But they have, they're looking to compete because they think they are the same. But the fact is they're not the same. Can men have children? Men, men do not have children. Women have children. They're physically different. They're emotionally different. And because they have different roles. And that is why Hashem made them different. And women have moved away from this tradition because they have forgotten what their message is, what their role is, what their purpose is in life. Anyway, even though men and women are different, as I said earlier, the two combine their forces and they have the same goal, they're able to live together. It is possible. Even though we say that there are quite a few differences, that's okay. If they share the same goal, if they realize what each one's role is, it is possible for, for them to work together. As Dr. Shem, in the coming weeks, we'll be talking a little bit more about how to find that special man or woman that is the most compatible. Because even though it is true that no matter who it is, both men and women, by the sheer force of their unique qualities, they can live together if they choose to. You can live with anybody you want. If you know how to conduct yourself, if you both have the same goal, nevertheless, there's no mistaking that certain people get along better than others. And I think that's something that all of you are aware of. There are certain people that we are attracted more to. There are certain people that we feel better with. And this all helps in creating that special kesher or special devik, that special glue that hopefully will be there when the two are married. There's several things that go into a successful marriage. One of them is knowing the goals and the roles that each one plays, which we spoke about briefly today. And the other important qualities and important conditions are of course the background of the two, the chemistry, and if the two are zoche, the two merit, if the two are soulmates, then of course the chances for success are greater. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean in any way that if the two are not soulmates that they cannot get along. That's a very important point that I want to stress because what are we going to be talking about now? Human relationships, right? Even though two people are different, even though they may not be soulmates, this is a second marriage or whatever, they can still get along. They can still preserve their marriage. What's required is the desire, the interest to succeed, number one. And number two, of course, to have the same matara, the same goal. If you're both headed to the same direction, if you both bring in the Kadosh Baruch Hu into the home, then any marriage can succeed, no matter how different you are. Obviously, the more similarities there are, the easier and the smoother the ride will be, Bezat Hashem. So I hope you come back next week, and Bezat Hashem, all of us together, will learn on how to truly build a Bayit Neemande Israel.